Do. I'm going to start recording now. Um, I just gave a very uh, amazing uh, introduction <laughs> to Chantal. Forgot to record it. I will put it up with this uh, when we post the video. So uh, Chantal, feel free to uh, begin when you're ready. Thank you, Matt. I, when um, Aya asked me to send her information, I didn't realize that you would be reading that. That was, that was uh, well, well done. It was really good, so I thought I'd... Uh, <laughs> thought yeah. I'd yeah. So thank you, everyone, for joining me this evening. Uh, what I'm going to be doing this evening is giving you a presentation um, on my initial research into my dissertation topic, Becoming Animal as Primal Theology in the Chasing Hunt. And I'm going to start us off with a little sound meditation and visual, uh, just to sort of help transport us a little bit into the mode and, and the world um, that I'm going to be talking about. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through uh, some of the major themes and some of the major topics that I'm going to be exploring in my research. And we can then have a bit of a discussion of how these different things uh, fit together. Because as you'll see, one of the things I'm trying to do in my research is to bring together uh, indigenous paradigmatic approaches uh, with Western philosophy, and then also frame that within a religious uh, ritual context. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot for us all uh, to discuss there together. Um, so without further ado, depending on your connection, the sound may be great or not be great. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. <laughs>
Okay. So um, what I'm going to be talking about is the conjunction of Bushman, the theories of Giles Deleuze and theology. And the first question that I'll pose to the audience, and you don't, don't have to answer, hopefully I'll answer it for you, is what do the San Bushman of Southern Africa, philosopher Giles Deleuze and theology have in common? Um, and I'd like to start out by saying that once upon a time, I believe that the answer was certainly nothing. Today, um, in an ever-evolving world of Eduardo Cohen's new animism, and in an attempt to find a new anthropology beyond the human, um, in an era of the Anthropocene, uh, I believe the answer is everything. And so um, the San Bushmen are one of the few remaining hunter-gatherers uh, that are still alive today whose actual ecological epistemology remains accessible to us. And so although uh, today most uh, San Bushmen no longer live in a traditional manner and they no longer have access to hunt, uh, in the way uh, that I'm going to be introducing, which is the subject of my research. Um, it was their fathers and their grandfathers uh, that still lived in this way, very much untouched by um, Western civilization and by modern capitalism until almost the 80s in some parts of Southern Africa. And so uh, the first anthropologists that came into touch with this group of people, uh, including uh, one of the most famous and professional uh, family of anthropologists, uh, the Marshall family, uh, that went to live with the San Bushman uh, in the 1970s, uh, came into touch with a worldview that was vastly at odds with our own um, and a worldview that uh, took everything about nature and the environment into account in a way uh, that we, we still battle uh, to get in touch with ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis in modernity. So that's sort of the first character in, in my research is uh, not only the San Bushmen themselves, but also the underlying epistemology that has made them who they are as a community and made them one of the most successful surviving communities over tens and tens of thousands of years. The second character is um, Giles Deleuze, a, a complex and often misunderstood philosopher of the Western tradition, who I believe in post-mortem has been given new life um, in his own new becomings as an environmental thinker. Uh, in, in the new field of Deleuzean studies, but also in an is interesting academic environment of a sort of post-colonial, post-modern, uh, post-humanist scholars who are, are looking to reconcile um, various forms of Western philosophy with alternative, um, more than human worldviews. The third character which is sort of uh, sometimes often pinned against the second, is theology, uh, which is, you know, uh, I think maybe 10 years ago, um, it, it wasn't necessarily deemed uh, very kosher to discuss indigenous culture within a context of the word religion. And it wasn't, uh, you know, deemed very kosher to discuss European philosophy. Uh, next to the word uh, religion. I think at the California Institute of Integral Studies, we understand this word to be much more encompassing uh, of a broader epistemological approach that includes uh, various traditions, cultures, forms of spirituality and belief. The, the, the reason why we use the word religion and the reason why I will use the word theology is because, uh, as Arvind Sharma pointed out, uh, we, we've also been accused of relegating indigenous traditions and indigenous forms of belief 
uh, to a type of pseudo neo shamanism, calling it spirituality and deeming it not worthy of uh, academic discussion within the formal debate of religion. And so I think, you know, when you look at the traditional understanding of the word uh, theology, which is the study of God and the nature of belief, uh, part of my research is to argue that in both the case of Deleuze and the San Bushman, um, they themselves are studying the nature of belief and the nature of God uh, through the earth and through the understanding um, of the earth where we live and breathe. So why is this important? And why is it important for me to bring these three uh, subject matters into dialogue uh, with one another? And I think this is, is also a question that uh, was important for me in uh, undertaking the degree in ecology, spirituality, and religion. So I really believe that as um, a feminist scholar, Eliz uh, Isabel Stangers points out is that we really live in a, a particular time, not, not only a sort of um, in general in the world, but particularly within academia and within philosophical environments where we need to begin to build bridges of understanding between uh, Western modes of thought and other ecological centered traditions from our own Western language base. And I think this is increasingly important. We've come out of a, a generation of uh, post-colonial scholarship where there, is, there has been a lot of uh, debate, uh, valid debate, but also a lot of unnecessary infighting as to who can talk on whose behalf, who can represent who. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the same time, I think that sometimes that debate has been missing the point is to come to a new common understanding of ethical engagement with the world. And so I think one of the results of this debate is a lot of uh, scholars have said, well, you know, we, we want to learn from different indigenous cultures, but at the same time, we're not indigenous. And even as a South African, uh, you know, I sit here as a, as a white South African, and I'm aware of the fact that even though I'm African, um, my, I am not an indigenous African. And so that, that led me uh, to sort of say that I, I felt it was important to find a language from the Western tradition, from a European tradition, uh, you know, which is a, probably a much bigger part of my heritage, uh, and look at how that comes into dialogue and into contact with the world that I was born into and with the world that I'd like to learn from. And so my vision is to interpret the chasing hunt, and I'll, I'll explain what that is, as an actual theological practice um, informed by uh, an ontologically unique cosmology, which I believe is unique to the San Bushman, uh, even though it, it can be explored within the broader realm of new animism. And, and it's also an epistemology that I believe is translatable into Western philosophical language. And it's not necessarily that I believe that Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari are the only ones who can help translate this for us. But, but this is what I was drawn to and, and this is what I would like to um, test the limits of. And so, who, who are um, the San Bushmen? I'm sure that, that all of you that are listening to this talk this evening, when, when I say the word Bushmen, uh, numerous images, visuals, or understandings uh, will come to mind. Um, I'm not going to do justice in, in this talk to, to introduce them as a multiplicity of groupings of communities. Uh, you know, I've, I, I, yeah, I've done this in, in various other speeches. I'd, I'd like more to get to some of the concepts that I'm trying to explore. But more, more broadly, um, the, the San Bushmen are from Southern Africa. Um, you, you know, they're hailed as the first people, so to speak, as one of the forerunners of our genetic ancestors. Uh, currently, 
They consist of uh, six or seven groupings, de depending which you know information you're looking at. That ranges uh, from South Africa uh, into Botswana and to northern Namibia and southern Angola. Uh, the majority of the sand bushmen that existed in South Africa today proper uh, are an extinct group of people, but they are also uh, one of the groups of people that gave us some of the most valuable historical data that we have in studying their ways of life in the sense that uh, a lot of that, that rock art that, that you saw uh, is from the Psalm uh, Bushmen who uh, lived in the interior, uh, in the Drakensberg and in, and, and in the northern uh, Karoo Desert. They were um, also imprisoned during the early colonial period. And there is an amazing, amazing archive uh, that was recorded um, by a general who had a number of Son um, Bushman prisoners come live with him. They're called uh, the Bleak and Lloyd archives. And he recorded um, pages and pages and pages, thousands of pages of their folklore and their stories. The amazing thing about these groupings uh, as far as, you know, North Namibia and then the extinct group in South Africa is that there are strong correlations between various aspects of their folklore, various aspects of the ways in which different groups employed uh, therianthropic imagery in rock art, and then uh, big correlations in, in um, their ritual practices, mainly uh, the trance dance, and then their hunting practices, uh, but even as small as certain songs, uh, certain dialectic aspects and certain ways in which um, we're not even sure how much contact one group had with the other, but certain ways in which they understood the environment. For example, their common understanding of um, how to use one particular beetle for the poison on their arrows, which they used to hunt. Um, so uh, they're truly a, a unique group of people in this aspect, which, as I said, uh, remained largely untouched by the Western world in, until the 20th century, even though at various points in time they came into contract, contact with different uh, Bantu tribes who were, who were moving from Zimbabwe south, and, and they were some of the first colonizers before the Europeans came, and this is a big part of South Africa's history, is actually who are the real first people of South Africa, because uh, the South African government is very insistent on claiming South Africa as a Bantu country, but in fact, it's, uh, you know, there were, there were prior people there before the Bantu cultures came in, um, came around. So the, their practices of, of how to live on the land um, span more than 70,000 years in some areas um, and, and sometimes even uh, more than 100,000 years. Uh, it's a whole world of study, like I said, that um, I, do, I don't want to say a lot of anthropologists have dug into, but a really core group of anthropologists have spent their entire lives uh, researching and there's a lot of very dedicated people who've spent more than 50, 60, 70 years working with the San Bushmen even post colonization and, and post sort of uh, border creation where um, their lands were separated due to the border creation between South Africa, Botswana and Namibia particularly and then the, the next big tra tragedy that happened to them which really sort of killed their way of life after the um, sort of wars uh, between South Africa and Namibia is the creation of um, wildlife parks, actually, where they were moved off their lands uh, for the protection of wildlife parks and, and their hunting rights have mostly been taken away from them. Uh, and a lot of these anthropologists who met them in the 50s and 60s and 70s continue to work with these groups of people and have built very strong relationships with individual families over, over decades, which is 
one of the reasons why I do not <laughs> see why I should now undertake such an, such an ethnography when, when I feel very honored to maybe work with some of those researchers and to understand you know, um, how they've interpreted their own work. So um, what is the San Bushman epistemology? And um, in my last talk that I did for the PCC forum, I, I showed a short clip from a video, a film called My Hunter's Heart, which I'd really still like to show the whole film uh, for PCC. It's a, it's a really heart-wrenching, beautiful film about um, Son Bushmen who know that they're not full, um, a, a gentleman who knows he's not a full man without being initiated as a hunter, but he doesn't have tribal leaders anymore to initiate him in a hunt. And he, he's already probably in his thirties. And he goes on a journey um, with these filmmakers to find a leader to initiate him as a hunter. And uh, so when I, I occasionally I'll quote him, his name's Koroha. And uh, one of the things that he says is in our world, animals were once people and people were once animals. And th this is, this is the, the, the primary um, thing that piqued my interest in undertaking a study of the San Bushman. I, I grew up in, in South Africa traveling to many of the areas where the now um, extinct Zom uh, Bushman lived. So I spent much of my holidays, what would be American summers, South African winters in the Drakensberg Mountains uh, looking at therianthropic rock art, uh, being really fascinated uh, by it. Um, but, but that sort of rock art is uh, a 200,000 year old lineage uh, traveling into the future of people who today uh, still have a base epistemology and understanding um, of a, a, a liminal difference between themselves and animals, which, which I believe is really fundamental to them being able to engage ecologically in, in a particular way. So Bushman cosmology, folklore, and storytelling, which is very fundamental to their entire culture, uh, informs every aspect of life. Uh, and in their cosmology, folklore, and storytelling, animals being once people and people once being animals, uh, is a part of every uh, day waking moment. And so my uh, external uh, dissertation committee advisor, uh, Professor Matthias Gunther, he's emeritus professor at the moment, and he just uh, published a new volume of work uh, that is trying to explore the subject human animal relations in hunter gatherer uh, cosmology. It's two volumes. Uh, he, he describes that their um, epistemology and, and their cosmology exists of three elements. So the world beyond, which, which would be the world of, of myth, the world of here and now, and then there's this liminal world of in between of ritual and these three worlds come into play with each other in a very interesting way uh, through uh, uh, what he calls an ontological flux between animals and humans and it plays out in a way that we we seldom actually see even in most indigenous cultures today because in a lot of indigenous cultures today and um, this, this world is relegated, this world of ontological flux is relegated to the world beyond or to very particular instances of the liminal world of ritual. And what Matthias Gunther does and more people are, are starting to explore in trying to bring the study of San uh, Bushman epistemology into dialogue with new animism is how in Bushman culture, the world beyond and the liminal world of ritual actually for them physically impacts the here and now and creates a type of ontological flux in the here and now. And that's a very critical point 
um, as to why, and I'll get to that as to why I wanted to bring this culture into dialogue with, with Giles Deleuze's concept of becoming. So um, much like the popular study of the ritual of the trance dance, my, my research looks at the chasing hunt as a liminal world of ritual that brings these three ontological worlds together and forms uh, what, I, what I call um, a primal theology. I see the dance, the hunt, the seeds of nature, it's all one thing. We are one blood, one blood traveling together. So the study of, of the Bushmen uh, and its cosmology is, is really um, interesting in itself as, as an evolving field. The first anthropologists that went to study the Bushmen uh, were, were very taken by the Bushmen as an ideal subsistence community, the ideal hunter-gatherers. Uh, there was a lot of uh, scientific work done uh, by the Harvard group, uh, amongst others, on how these people were, um, quote-unquote, the first scientists how they understood nature to the greatest extent, how they understood very well um, the principles of, of how many humans can live on a piece of land in which combination with which foods, how much hunting needs to be done um, in comparison to how much gathering needs to be done. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the books that anyone in this field sort of reads, and it's actually available on audio, uh, on Audible, and it's a wonderful book to listen to on Audible, is Elizabeth um, Marshall Thomas's The Old Way, which she, you know, where she sort of recounts her family's journey with the Bushmen, and she goes into great depth to describe all the different areas of life um, that, that sort of... Um, show that they are the ideal subsistence community from how they managed uh, one child every four years, you know, so that they had great population control to the way they brought up the children, to the way they engaged with, with gift giving. So a lot of the anthropology was centered on this in a very technical environmental and technical ecological way. The next wave of people studying the Son Bushmen became obsessed with them as a people that speak to the spirits. And, and this was, you know, in the era where, where everyone um, sort of was engaging in the early days of shamanism and the Western world was becoming interested in shamanism and the trance dance became a, a very uh, you know, popular activity to study, a very popular tourist activity to try and engage in. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, when I was growing up, when I was young, like the, the trance dance, like scared me. <laughs> like it really did. I, I didn't understand it um, out of the broader context that it was being plucked out of. So, you know, it was often presented as the sort of shamanistic ritual where people would leave their minds and, and join the ancestors. And, and it never kind of made sense to me. Now it does in, in a much bigger context, but it's not what, it's actually what deterred me from engaging in this culture, not what drew me, you know, sort of in a sense to, to engaging um, in this culture. What drew me to this culture is my, when I was an undergraduate, my very um, second lecture as a film student was by Craig Foster. Him and his brother Damon um, grew up in the wild, uh, two white Cape Town boys all their lives, um, filming the ocean and, and nature. And they were the first ones to, to live with the Bushmen and to film the full chasing hunt. And my second film class I had was by uh, Craig Foster and, and he was showing us some, at the time the film wasn't even released, he was showing us some, some video footage uh, of this film. And I was incredibly struck um, by their sort of uh, holistic relational ontology. 
to all facets of life. And I think this is what is now the third phase of Son Bushman's studies, particularly in the wave of, of new animism and, and in the wave of some of the work that um, people like Tim Ingold have done is we're, we're looking for a new ontology and we're looking to reframe um, what does relational ontology mean in different, in different contexts? And now for the first time, the Bushmen are being studied within that context, taking into account that you need um, that, that ideal subsistence community, people who speak to the spirits uh, 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 to form a relational ontology. But these, these are all a part of a, a bigger whole. So the, the chasing hunt which is a hunt, um, a very difficult hunt. There's, there's multiple ways in which Bushmen hunt, but the chasing hunt is, is, is the epitome, uh, epitome of, how could I put it, um, the relational ontology hunt. It's, it's the epitome of um, entering a, a spiritual state of transformation through a physical subsistence act and you, you actually undertake trance dance before you go on such a hunt. It, it is something that a hunter um, undertakes where he prepares and there's two ways that it can take place. He either actually outruns the animal and he has, he, what's amazing is for example, they know how to outrun an animal by knowing exactly at what point in the heat of a day, an animal's blood will boil, etc., and where a human can outrun an animal. So they have an incredible understanding of, of the animal itself, but they can either outrun the animal or they run track the animal to the point of the animal actually uh, giving up. And, and so the particular process that takes place physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and ontologically, in order to really understand that animal, to, to take on that animal, um, I feel that it, that it brings all these, these different uh, things together. So that, that chasing hunt is an epistemological symbol um, of a ritualized ecology of being in the world that although even they don't have access to it today, um, in the film, My Hunter's Heart, that community, by the way, approached the filmmakers to make that film because they believed that the knowledge of the hunt, even though it's lost to them by and large, is of value to the greater world. And hunter-gatherer knowledge is, is of value uh, to the greater world. So, so at the heart of this epistemology is a lived cosmology of ontological flux between human, more than human animals, um, that, that is characterized in therianthropic um, imagery, which is the way we used to study Bushmen by and large, but it's actually still a very um, strong part of their belief system uh, to this day. So I'm going to read a quote here by Matthias Gunther, uh, who I've been talking about. <clears throat> uh, there are moments at which the ontological ambiguity and instability of humans and non-humans that is manifest in myth and ritual also enters humans' awareness in real life in the real world. The effects of these reiterations of transformation and ontological flux is that it contributes towards grounding the extraordinary ontology of myth within reality. An epistemological process that is reinforced by the San who live in a vibrantly oral culture in which people frequently tell and listen to myth. And, and interesting is that um, the hunt is a very big part of this telling and the storytelling. So a lot of, a lot, when, when people have spent time um, with Bushmen, uh, uh, you know, from Elizabeth Thomas Marshall, to the anthropologist today, like James Suzman, uh, they talk about how the hunt is a very big talking point of myth-making, storytelling, and story uh, retelling. 
So this 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 um, this ontological fluidity is reinforced continually uh, through through day to day lived practice, and then again um, in the recalling of their own memory and their own history. Um, and I just want to say something interesting about the way that they tell story, which I think is is very sort of non Western. Is um, everyone is asked like so in a night on a circle people are asked to retell a story and it's the same story and everyone's asked to tell the story the way they want to tell the story and what's important is not the facts of the story and what really happened but what's important is that each person's character personality comes out and their contribution to the circle and their community comes out through the way that they choose um, to tell the story. So, so at the heart of this sort of epistemology that I've been talking about and this ontological flux is, is something that anthropologists have called a primal time. So Son Bushman uh, have, and, and this is not unique to them, but, but I think it's, it is unique in the way it plays out is they have two orders of time. They have the first order, which is an order where um, ontology was entirely fluid. This is an order that existed before the world that we know was created. And then, and then there's the, the order of today, which, which um, inherited certain aspects of ontological fluidity, but not, not in the same way. So I, I tried to find a particular story that I remembered I read and, and I, uh, it was going to take me too long. So I sort of just dropped it. Uh, but there are myriads and myriads of stories from the first order where the moon becomes the meerkat and then the meerkat becomes the lion and the antler and then the antler marries um, you know, uh, the, the meerkat and then, and then who they birth is, is the sun. And so th there's, there's, there's really, um, they, they have, um, how could I put it? They're incredibly comfortable with things becoming what they are in essence and also what they're not in physical tangility. And this little um, sort of quote that I just put here will not quote this, this um, piece of a story. I'll just read the, the first um, sort of three lines is, therefore we see that the baboon's belly resembles the quacha, which this is an, ex this is, there's a few of them that still exist, but this is a, a, an extinct mixed bred animal in any event. For they feel that they were once people, they and the quacha, Therefore, their parts resemble humans, for they feel that they are people. That is why their parts smell like people. That is why the baboon still understands like man. That is why the baboon still speaks and sounds like man. And what's really interesting, the more you read these types of stories, is that you start to understand that they themselves are very comfortable being fully human but they also understand it at every point and moment they're that they're only part human, that there are other parts of them that are animal, but that, that that's never viewed as them being inferior or superior, or it's just different. We, we all have different um, roles to play within the environment and nature, um, and they have no problem being animal all being human, even though right now in this order, uh, they are human. And, and I think that's, that's something we, even to this day, when we're trying to not be anthropocentric and we're, we're trying to sort of look at post-humanist studies, um, I, I don't think we, we quite know how to, how to feel that way exactly. So, um, Moving on now just to, to Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, uh, and I, I won't go into their background because this will take too much time, is one of the interested I reasons I was interested in them and their work is I feel that um, 
in a lot of environmental thinkers are using them to bring the world of new animism and process thought into one room. You know, one of the reasons why I came to CIS and, and one of the things that I get very irritated about in different academic circles is this division between sort of departments, even though I know we, that, that um, distinction is important, I don't think we need this division. And um, I think that although process thought has done a lot uh, to sort of um, reclaiming uh, a, a positive essence in Western philosophy, I think that it's still very much pinned up against the um, sort of European philosophical tradition of deconstructionism. And, and I think that a lot of environmental thinkers are trying to actually use Deleuze, even though he hails from that French philosophical thought, uh, to bridge these two things. The initial two aspects of um, Deleuze's philosophy that attracted me was the rhizome and his understanding of becoming. Uh, so um, many of you may be familiar with the, the idea of the rhizome, which scientifically, by the way, is, is a particularly in complexity science, which funny, when I was working in, um, in commercial agriculture, I came into a lot of contact with complexity science. And so maybe this is why his theory resonated with me so much. But, um, but the rhizome, you know, is an idea of a network much more than it, than it is an idea of a hierarchy. And so Deleuze talks about um, the tree is filiation, but the rhizome is alliance. And, um, you know, I think uh, uh, Laura Pustafi in her dissertation defense sort of um, bashed Deleuze's understanding of, of the tree, but uh, you've got to take him in the context where he comes from too. But I think if we understand trees today, they don't work through arborescent networks the way that Darwinian science describes them. They actually work through rhizomes. And the more and more we understand sort of plant intelligence, we understand that everything uh, works, through, works through a rhizome, which is in some ways, it, it's a network of um, not only sharing, but it's a network of infection. Um, which is which is something that we also really battle to deal with uh, in the West. Then, then becoming um, and his concept, oh sorry, of becoming through uh, a, a rhizomatic network, where one thing is not really discerned from another, and where there becomes this zone of proximity where things meet, and in that zone. They sort of they they merge in some part or way, uh, really resonated with me um, on this level of trying to understand ontological flux uh, within a Western uh, philosophical tradition. Now I know you know Deleuze wrote at a time where where a lot of thought and discussion in Europe was was against capitalism was against the state so sort of these these sort of like macro structures um, but, a, but a lot of people today and I can mention some of those at the end <clears throat> are, are using this theory now to look at microstructures um, and 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 doing it in in a very valuable way so um, one of these quotes that I, that I really love uh, in my last comp, I looked more at this relationship between Deleuze and uh, process thought. And, and um, I looked at him outside of the sort of deconstructionist French tradition. And uh, I looked at him uh, in conjunction with, with Whitehead. And um, he, he writes here in What is Philosophy? The philosopher must become non-philosopher so that non-philosophy becomes the earth and people of philosophy. And so, although I started at the rhizome and becoming, I, I found that these weren't enough. And the more I dug into uh, Deleuze Gotarian theory, because a lot of these theories that he builds, he really does in, in conjunction with Gotari, I realized that uh, nomadology and geophilosophy 
And then also his understanding of deterialization and reterialization of space is really, is really fundamental to, a, to Westerners trying to grasp hunter-gatherers in some way. Um, and so uh, what grasped me more than, than nomadology, which would seem like an obvious one, is the concept of geophilosophy. Uh, so thinking of the earth as a, a philosophical space in and of itself of, of you know, um, his concept of the plane of eminence is often described um, in his theory of geophilosophy. And it's a space where he breaks from transcendence and, and moves to an understanding of eminence. And he, there's certain philosophers that he sort of draws a lot from. One of them is actually Baruch Spinoza. And um, in, in doing that, I think what Deleuze is often trying to get to, which I think a lot of people sort of misunderstand, is in our sort of Abrahamic uh, tradition, and it's not even Abrahamic, you can say this in, in Hinduism and even maybe in Buddhism and a lot of other traditions, that there's a tendency uh, towards an understanding of nirvana as a transcendent act and experience. Um, and, you know, anthropologists will say this, this is sort of a phase that we moved into in the Neolithic era, like past the hunter-gatherers. Uh, but what does that say about what the hunter-gatherers have to teach us in this current era of the Anthropocene? And I think what they have to teach us is for them, in a sense, heaven came and heaven was on earth. Heaven is on earth. Heaven is in the earth. And so Deleuze's sort of theories of a plane of eminence on the earth, which a lot of scholars in the environmental humanities is now explaining, is something that I think is very compatible uh, with, with the epistemology of hunter-gatherers that although they look to the sky and connected with spirits and ancestors, everything actually converged in, a, in different forms of becoming in the zone of proximity that was earthbound. Uh, it wasn't bound in a transcendent realm that was other. Uh, it's in this realm, which I, which I think is, is pretty critical for this day and age. Um, so rather thinking takes place in the relationship of territory and the earth. The earth is not one element among others, but rather brings together all the elements within a single embrace while using one or another of them to deterritorialize territory. Philosophy is re-territorialized on the concept. The concept is not object, but territory. If philosophy begins with the creation of concepts, then the plane of eminence must be regarded as pre-philosophical. Now, that's quite a mouthful, and I, I think one needs to read that and meditate on that um, quite a bit. And I'll give you an example of I, the way I really saw this sort of play out is I actually went yesterday to a film that was playing at Sundance called Okavanga Delta, River of Dreams. The filmmakers have lived in a tent in Botswana for 20 years, and they wanted to really make a film that was a poem to the river. And one of the central characters that they um, chose in this poem was the elephant. They really showed how the elephant um, deterritorializes and re-territorializes actual earth in order to help the river shift and move and flow. And, the, and these elephants move up and down the river during different parts of the season and in and out the delta. And they're disturbing and they're moving and they're shifting things. And, and in that, um, they're creating this, this plane of eminence where this life can exist with abundance and abundance of, of species. And, and it sort of made me think that I really believe that there was a time, and this is not a pre, like this is not an idyllic time, it was a very practical time, where man was a part of that process, where man was very much like that, that elephant, 
Um, and I know Elizabeth Thomas Marshall talks about that. So um, I think that what Deleuze is often trying to get to without being connected to these cultures is a philosophy of the earth. And, and so um, it's, for me, it's an epistemology that is informed um, by what should be a lived cosmology. A, a, a cos, you know, what I've learned from the Bushmen is that a cosmology and myth are, are not mere distant stories. They need to be embodied through day-to-day -day ritual practice, and that takes, um, you know, shape in various forms. Uh, that brings us into a, a continual process of, of becoming um, with the earth, in a sense, as Deleuze says, um, a, a pre-philosophical uh, form of thinking and being. Uh, and in closing, you know, with the section, um, I, um, in the introduction to what is philosophy, Tart says that to write for the illiterate, to speak for the aphasic, to think for the acephalous, but what does for mean? Mm -hmm. It is a question of becoming. And I, this is really critical in this point of, a, of what is appropriation and what is not appropriation. And I think it's this, this for means not objectification, not projection, uh, but a type of becoming. The, the thinker is not acephalic, aphasic, or illiterate, but becomes so. We think and write for animals themselves. The agony of a rat or the slaughter of a calf remains present in thought, not through pity, but as the zone of exchange between man and animal in which something of one passes into the other. And um, so that's, that's sort of, I, I didn't say this before I touched on this, but, but that's what I would hope to get to, and of course, discussing a lot more in terms of what is, what is primal theology and how can we uh, understand primal theology is it's a way of becoming that is, is not um, just a type of abstract philosophical belief, but is actually a lived epistemology um, that, that we actually embody on a day-to-day -day basis uh, through our own engaged uh, ritual practice. So, um, so thank you. Um, for sitting through that <laughs> and yeah and um i think i i'd love to to hear what questions or what thoughts ca came up for you all well thank you so much chantal for that um i'm gonna have to sit with that for a little bit um before i even attempt a question um, but I really, I just want to say well, one of the things I've been wondering about in particular is um, the relationship between spirituality as it relates to particular subsistence practices. Um, and so, you know, so I come from, uh, you know, anthropologist uh, Marvin Harris, right, who's a sort of a cultural materialist and, and really looking at um, the economic mode and the um, infrastructure or the subsistence techniques as forming the sort of core practices around which the entire culture is based. And, and what spirituality does uh, is it provides a way of understanding that relationship uh, in sacred terms um, that uh, are able to be, you know, deepened and uh, anyway. So, so to hear um, to hear the trance dance um, as 
preparation for the chase hunt um, as, and then, you know, as an initiation and ritual and uh, myth, um, it all seems very much to embody exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, you know, or, or that, that sort of metaphysical um, and, and bridging the materialist and, and spirituality. And um, anyway, so like I said, I'm, I'm still processing that, but that was, that was great to see. Yeah, one of the things, Matt, that really struck me is um, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, when she, she has this chapter where she deals with a hunt, and, you know, she really attacks this idea that we think that hunter-gatherers didn't develop past a certain point because they couldn't, mm. because they couldn't figure out how to develop smarter technologies. And she, she really sort of um, lays out very clearly that, that what she understands from them directly is that they didn't want to. It's not that they couldn't, it's that they didn't think it was necessary and that they don't do what they don't deem necessary that they feel is going to break that really fine line, that, that spiritual balance between where we can take, where we can consume, and how we should consume. And, and one of the simplest examples of this is that um, she sort of realizes over time that they didn't not create a smarter bow and arrow because they couldn't figure it out. They didn't want to because they don't want to make the hunt easier because they don't actually want to bring the hunt to, they understand human nature. They're also not stupid in that regard. They understand the tendencies of humans when, in a sense, oftentimes things become easy for us to overindulge. Mm -hmm. And the whole structure of the hunt is difficult and arduous and mentally, emotionally, and spiritually engaging on purpose in order to maintain that right balance of taking life between the two species. And that kind of really blew me away because even to this day, you know, um, sort of Bushman hunters who are still have memory of those old days who live in these like, I don't know, shanty town camps who will go out and hunt with dogs or whatever, you know, like just not in the old way, so to speak, they, they know it and they'll say it and they'll say how these ways have um, really destroyed and corrupted the moral value of their communities. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's hard to, under, you know, understand what else they can do because they're basically living in camps. Um, but, but they're not even till this day, even having had so much rob from them, they're, they understand it. They're not stupid. Yeah. Um, and they understand that balance you're talking about. And it's, it's interesting too, um, you know, it seems like in in a, in a number of places, uh, hunter gatherers have refused uh, sedentism and agriculture, um, and we're seeing all of this um, data come back. You know, saying that uh, hunter gatherers had more uh, leisure time, right? Uh, had had better health, uh, had um, what seems to be a more um, a way of life that uh, was in many ways. Well, I think, I think when you say sort of refuse the conveniences of developing technology, that seems to be a um, really interesting point because you can um, sort of see how, how this trap of becoming more and more dependent on more and more complex and specialized technology uh, can really make you more dependent on um, on those on those aspects of a of a society, which can um, potentially be quite problematic if you are uh, if you have you know if those technologies break down or or all of this other. Uh, yeah, well, you, and Marvin you're losing those old ways. Yeah, and I think I think they see a very strong moral implication to it too. Mm -hmm. 
um, which is one I think we we battle to understand. I mean, we we barely managed to get it together to get a group in government together to talk about like AI ethics or you know we yeah we I mean we just we battle with all of that. Well, I um, I just uh, just wanted to comment. First of all, thank you so much, Leslie, for the um, for that wonderful um, beginning meditation with the music and the beautiful photographs. Um, really brought us um, into into the presentation. Um, one of the things that the, the only thing I really know about the sand Bushman is something I learned from um, Louis Herman, who wrote um, Future Primal, um, and he. I think he, he used his philosopher was Eric Hoagland. Um, but what I appreciate um, what you did tonight was I, I don't know that much about um, Deleuze a little bit, um, but you gave me uh, more context for him. So I appreciated that. And um, of course I study Whitehead. So process, <laughs> how things are interrelated, highly radically interrelated. Um, just wanted to know if you could just speak a little bit more about um, how the the um, sand communicate amongst themselves. You gave one example tonight, um, showing how they all could voice a different version or different facets of a story. And um, I think one of the things I, I had learned, I think, from Lou's book was, um, you know, when they're all sitting together, they're always always talking. Is that is that correct? They're you know everybody's always talking and talking over each other and there's a constant conversation going. And um, it's just such a, a wonderful example of um, showing, um, you know, this individuality within the group collective that, that, that um, just, just how does it work? You know, we, we, especially English speakers, we stop, we stop and we talk and then we wait for the other person to talk. And, you know, we don't have this idea of talking over each other and this individuation going on at the same time. So anyway, just, just such a, one example of um, of that. I just wonder if you could just had any more comments on that, or you could speak a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, I think firstly, I I'm not sure that I've come across a great amount of consensus of how different groups mixed, because um, you know, I, so we we often have this sort of misconception that indigenous communities and cultures. Uh, sort of all, how could I put it, that they, that they gathered in large communities together, you know, small families and they connected, which, which isn't always the case. So, um, Saw and Bushmen are, are very territorial in, in a non-war-like um, manner in the sense that how could I put it? Understanding territory, they, they never, there's no evidence they ever fought over territory. There was never any need to. Uh, they never populated the land enough to, which is quite an interesting concept. You know, you think like 70,000 years, they were on the same piece of land. They never outgrew it. They never overpopulated, which is like incredibly fascinating, like just for one. But they they didn't come together and live in big groups and communities. So they never urbanized, so to speak. They were always semi-nomadic. And so the, the way that they would work is they would work in these small family type structures. And the minute a family would get to a certain size, a small group, they would split off mm -hmm. and then move out in, into these continual splitting off of territories. And then they come back into contact with each other and there would be exchanges, even sometimes for marriages, et cetera. And these exchanges work through, through a very unique, particular gift-giving process that they have, which is also a process that, that can be likened to a lot of Eastern traditions because they're very non-possessional. So gifts are there to hand over, which you, once you receive a gift, you then need to hand over that gift to someone else at some point. Or it, it's possessions are, they just pop pass, you know, basically in a sense through your life. So, so there's this connection and this communication, even though they're incredibly separated, 
and incredibly isolated. How they manage to carry certain cultural aspects amongst each other over vast periods of time and vast geographies, when you look at like person per square kilometer, um, I'm not sure we anthropologists have really figured that out yet. It's, 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 it's quite amazing. What, one thing though that is very clear is within a community, like you said, there's no, um, everyone's business is everyone's business in a sense within, still within very, um, how could I put it, respectful um, roles. So one of the things that's also really fascinating about them is unlike our modern era, they actually are one of the communities that have very strict gender roles, but not in a patriarchal way. And um, today it might play itself out in a more patriarchal way in, in current communities. Um, but there's just certain things that women do, certain things that men do, certain things that kids do, certain things that old people do, and then certain things that everyone does, including certain aspects of rearing kids. So there's this interesting dynamic of a duality, which is enforced and broken all at once. And this, they're, they're, I think what really categorizes them is contradiction. So they'll have these roles set out, which are also constantly broken by other roles that are played in the community. And that's the way, so there's elders, which you respect, but then there's this constant kids must come up and they must talk at the fireplace and they must talk over the elders and they, um, and so I think that there is a real sense of freedom of expression. There really is because there's no, um, how, you, you don't grow up to be an engineer, right? Or you don't grow up to be an artist. You grow up to be a member of that community. And in that small band, that community, if you're 20 to 30 people, you need to survive as that 20 to 30 people. And, and like even a really simple example of this is that there's this one story of a particular drought comes about and they talk about generational memory. Like no one is expected to know everything in a community, but you have the grandfather, the great grandfather, the uncles, the aunts, etc., cetera. And, and everyone's lived through something. So all of those members of that community are supposed to bring a collective environmental knowledge in order to teach people, you know, sort of how to survive. So this is very much what the storytelling is about. It's not just a form of entertainment. It's a form of knowledge sharing, but in an entertaining manner. And, and even I think a lot of anthropologists and filmmakers and Louis Herman himself has commented on this as, they're incredibly humorous people and they, they love life and they want to enjoy and make fun of life. So, and this is where the boundaries again become contradictory. It's, we don't need to know the exact facts of everything. It's what's important is the, the essence um, that that's sort of coming through. So I don't know if that, you know, answers anything. Um, it's, yeah, the, it's, it's just sometimes really hard to understand in the way that we, try to calculate these things, I think. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, you added a lot, uh, a lot to my address. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I wanted to make a few comments. Um, I don't know if it's possible. Of course, Joan. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, um, you know, I, there's a lot of other cultures that, that do the, you know, the person being an animal and the person being a person. Uh, they do that. Actually, I did a, 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 an extensive paper for Jim Ryan uh, in, on that. In, uh, in, in the, uh, there were, uh, when the British were occupying India, and uh, later, they started in the later part of the 1800s and, and, and actually all the way up to, I think it was 1949 or something. Uh, the British, uh, some um, anthropologists went in, in the mountains where the indigenous cultures live and uh, actually 
they actually have examples of where people be, people are animals and they become people. And actually, uh, in the uh, the uh, along the in the Arctic Circle area, that also happens with indigenous people. So it, I, I, you know, I, I was wondering about that, and also. Um, I even was thinking about the similarity could be could be, could be due to that these people are living in and uh, very very connected to nature. You know, the people that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, I think this is. I I think a lot of indigenous cultures do are very similar in that way. Yeah. So. Um you know, the, there's a lot of work done on indigenous cultures view of animals in general, and mm -hmm. even in, with regards to hunting rights. So yeah. um, I, I want to point out that, that there's um, different schools of thought have influenced different like disciplines of, of research on the subject. And a lot of it has to do with colonization and colonialism. So for example, the school where new animism comes out of Mm -hmm. um, where uh, Philippe Descola is, is, you know, one of the leaders of, and Viveros de Castros and Eduardo Cohen. These these people come out of uh, uh, a more uh, French-centered anthropological school of thought uh, that followed um, that that tried to reinvent animism, and they spent a lot of time studying first and foremost, um, you know, indigenous communities and tribes in South America and particularly Amazonian tribes. Mm -hmm. And they, they looked at this uh, type of relational ontology in this context. Um, we also then have various scholars uh, of different countries and schools of thoughts that you said that looked at like the North American and indigenous environment. Um, the African or Southern African, let me be more specific, the Southern African environment was very dominated again by its colonizers, which were Dutch and German mm -hmm. and occasionally British, but, but primarily Dutch and German. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't come out of this, this animism or new animism school of thought. So one of the things that Matthias Gunther is trying to do is he's trying to bring the dialogue of the discussion of relational ontology of the Bushmen into dialogue with, the, with these other schools of thought on indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. And to say that there are these broad similarities is very true, but I also think it's important to recognize the strong differences mm -hmm. in the cosmologies mm -hmm. um, and, and in, the, in the particular ways that these cosmologies are lived out at different points, because for example, if you look at say some of the hunter gatherers like the Koyakan in the Arctic, mm -hmm. they, um, they were colonized a lot longer uh, time ago. So mm -hmm. like th th they, the Russians got there and then various, so it's been a long time since they've had that particular type of ontological relationship with, with that cosmology which you can see how it, it's not that the cosmology disappears, it's just the way it plays out in day-to-day -day life becomes less and less and it starts to become more myth and it starts to become more of an abstract epistemology as, as the time period between their forced colonization. And so, so what was unique, unique about the Bushmen and unique also about a lot of Amazonian tribes is their 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 period between contact and now mm -hmm. um, is shorter than mm -hmm. say a lot of Native American tribes or a lot of like Canadian tribes. Yeah. Um, and so there's things that you can study and gather about their understanding of ontology, which is maybe more mythical and distant mm -hmm. in some of those North American tribes. It doesn't mean it didn't exist on the same level uh, it's just a, it's just a different point of reference due to due to different history. Oh yeah, so it's the Bushmen are still living their tradition. Well, not anymore, but but no. they were in the seventies. Okay, and, and that's, do you know what I'm saying? That's a closer that's time ancient. period than the eighteen hundreds, for example. Yeah. Yes, or the yeah, 
I think the people in India did did probably did survive into um, well uh, yeah actually you're right I think uh, when the British moved in in the, I think the mid 1800s uh, that really you know they they were there in the beginning and it, they were very traditional but it didn't after a while like even now there's a lot of people who live in the cities who used to be uh, native traditional. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> hmm. Betty, Aya, you came a little late, but um, do you have any questions for our guest? I'll let them think. <laughs> um, Chantal, I'm interested. Um, there's been a lot of I think Jared Diamond wrote a book on, on sort of what can we learn from traditional um, cultures. Um, and I think, especially recently, there's been a lot of um, a lot of discourse around, you know, looking at indigenous, um, indigenous communities and the relationship with the land as models for how we need to kind of rethink um, modern industrial societies uh, relationships uh, and sort of take leadership um, from those communities. Um, and you look at you look at a group like the San that's been kind of living the same way for 70,000 years and um, or however long and really can't find a better model than that it would seem for, for the <laughs> definition of a sustainable community. Um, and so I guess I'm curious kind of how you on the one hand might um, take some of, of what you've learned um, into your own life living in um, I guess Utah right now uh, but also in San Francisco and in and, and South Africa. Um, so there's that part of it. And then I'm also wondering in terms of this idea of um, this lived, you know, epistemology has lived uh, cosmology that integrates myth, story, and ritual. And there's this continual process of becoming. Do you think that's especially different uh, from the sun on the one hand and the way we engage with uh, epistemology? Or do you think that's kind of a human, um, a human, way of approaching knowledge to some degree in a kind of iterating feedback loop that sort of, you know, you look at say uh, Passion of the Western Mind and you see all of these different methods and all of these different epistemologies from materialism and idealism and uh, realism and et cetera. Um, and the entire world view shifts and with it the entire world. So I guess I'm wondering, do you, do you see, um, how do you see, I guess, the difference between our epistemologies? Is it so completely different? Do you feel like there's overlap there? Um, and then also, again, bringing, bringing those lessons into your own daily lives. Well, I, I'll start by saying that I do think we all sort of, um, we're wired to function the same way. So whether we believe it or not, whether we realize it or not, we are constantly generating cosmologies and they then do in turn inform our epistemologies. And then that then in turn informs our ritual practices. And, and that, that cosmology can be the cosmology we've developed through the history of Cartesian science, which then informs a certain epistemology of the world and then informs a certain ritual practice, which is our technology dependent ritual practice, you know, on a, on a day to day basis, just as a very, very sort of simplistic um, example. So, 
I think that we see ourselves in some sense as very different from these cultures because we don't believe we're doing those things, but we are because we're all human. And as, hu as old as time is for the human, we have been doing those things. And the weirdest thing is that I think that we've always understood ourselves to be doing those things. And it's only until recently in this modern era where we separate uh, spiritual, uh, religious, and belief practices from the rest of our lives that we are now, that we are now trying to see ourselves as not doing those things. And Although, for example, there's very complex discussions about things like separation of state and church, which, you know, I would really, um, I wish we had separation of state and church in America, for example, because that would create an environment for, for plurality of religious beliefs. So, so I'm not talking against those fundamentals that I think we all, in a sense, agree on. But when we separate belief from ourselves as cosmological beings and we try to separate ourselves from being believing beings um, this is where th there's a very big disconnect where we don't know then how to connect to our environment whatever that environment is so i think that you know on a, on a very um, and I don't want to say on a superficial level, but on a very basic level, I really believe that this is what ESR and PCC is trying to achieve. They're trying to reconnect us as the modern human back to our cosmologies, back to a cosmology. They're trying to lead us on a journey to find a cosmology that we can engage with that then informs a healthier epistemology and then again in turn informs a new way of ritual practice and i think um you know coming out of africa and coming out of south africa and being white you can often um you can become sort of self-loathing and you see yourself as coming from the devil colonization tradition that has nothing to offer. And I think that's also something that PCC and ESR is taught is that even though I'm highly unlikely going to use uh, Western philosophy as my main point of environmental reference in terms of how to like build good ritual practices today, um, it, I, I feel that I do actually need to go there to build my, rebuild my cosmology in a sense, you know, and, and it's even, even for example, like I've been attracted to um, the Jewish tradition my whole life on a personal basis. And my husband and I talk a lot about how does one re-envisage this cosmology and within our, our current environment and how do we apply an environmental hermeneutic um, to these texts, to these traditions. And, and so, yeah, I think that that's the first thing is to reconnect basically to a cosmology. And then in some sense, you need to, you need to let it play itself out from, from there. Um, on the same basis, I think that with, possible we need to allow people of indigenous heritage in various shapes and forms to reconnect to their cosmology you know we we whilst we're trying to reconnect to our cosmological past we we still need to continually recognize what our cultures and traditions have stolen from others and where possible we need to give them the space Space to not only connect to their cosmology on a mythical level, like I was talking to with Joan, on a superficial story level, but on a practiced epistemological level. So that's not always possible, given like the way we've built the nation state. But in like Australia, in there's certain and New Zealand. Look at the New Zealand. For my sister works. Um, for the climate authority in Australia. And she's been telling me about how New Zealand has written all these indigenous um, bylaws into their 
uh, environmental um, laws and given in indigenous ruling uh, precedence over environmental decisions within the country. And I think Australia is leaning towards that. And I think America could do with leaning towards that. I know a lot of uh, Sweden, Norway, a, a number of other countries where indigenous um, communities have representation are leaning towards that. So I think that's something we should all be um, promoting and, and, and supporting. Um, and then I think in terms of our own, you know, personal practice, I do think it's a, it's a dual practice because again, we can't idealize, we can't move back to a world that no longer exists for very practical reasons. I mean, in the case of the San Bushman, the governments that control, that run the states that these people live in, this is not Australia or Norway or this is a very dire situation. These people have zero autonomy right now to live out any of their rituals, um, epistemology or cosmology, and it's, it's incredibly depressing um, and sad. And so I think there's two things that I take in that regard is, one, what can I take from my own cosmology to change my own worldview for day-to-day -day practices? And and two, what can they, and I do see them as part of my heritage, I do see them as part of my ancestry as a human, you know, in the greater planet and, and as someone coming from, from South Africa, is what principles can I take for them? And, and one, of, one of those things is, is my, currently is my relationship, you know, like, for example, to meet and, and um, I, I was, I've been on and off vegetarian for many years and um, when I was in San Francisco and, and I wanted to not be vegetarian anymore, I engaged in maybe one supplier or two suppliers of produce. But now I'm now living here, for example, in Utah, um, we actually have uh, real sources available to us of local producers that farm in a particular way, um, of places that I can go to, I can see, I can engage in and and so I, I think I think about that a lot is is how do I engage in, in more holistic practices in, in the places I live and how do I choose? It's it's also partly one of the reasons why I want to be here right now is I I want to be in a space where um, I can practice some of those things whilst I'm writing this dissertation and. Um, like my brother-in-law, for example, is trying to learn how to bow hunt <laughs> along similar. We all have a, a different journey, but I, I think the point is you, you need to find ritual practices to engage in that are, are not just, um, how could I put it, that are not just symbolic, that are practical. And it, this is something that I feel we have a lot to learn from from indigenous communities is that a ritual practice can actually be shopping, you know, and the way I go about shopping and buying the produce. So in the summer year, for example, we have a farmer's market every week with incredibly local produce. And I really see this as such a privilege for those four months as a ritual practice, going there, engaging with those farmers, learning about their farms, eating the food feels so good and, and just, you know, so I think like that, that, I think that touches one part of your question is that ritual practices for like hunter gatherers and especially what I know of Son Bushman is not the trance dance. And I think this has been one of the mistakes in the past. It is also the trance dance, but we've tried to make it like exclusively something like the trance dance. It's, it's everything, you know, it's all aspects of life. Um, and I think the more that we treat all these different aspects of life with respect, uh, that we're moving towards a more indigenous, you know, sort of worldview. Thank you so much for that.
uh, just to let everybody know, we have uh, the space scheduled uh, until nine o'clock, I believe, which is maybe 20 more minutes. So I know we've been talking for quite a long time, but uh, we've been happy to uh, happy to hear this. This is um, this is a great uh, great discussion. Great great topic that you're doing, Chantal. So I commend you for um, for doing it and sharing it with us. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you for holding this platform. And um, I, I just want to ask us, well, you know, before we conclude, how how some of these thoughts sit with your future research? And because I know you um, are also interested in uh, related fields, and uh, what does it bring up for you in terms of your own research? Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's putting me on spot. Um, and I will sort of reflect that question back to uh, Joan and Pia uh, and Aya and Betty. Um, I think, you know, I took, I took Elizabeth's class science, psychology and contested knowledge uh, last semester. Um, and, you know, I think, I think what is, at the heart of this is traditional ecological knowledge, you know, and how we go about um, translating, you know, our observations of the natural world into um, into maybe those those that epistemology where we're learning how to relate and how to act in accordance and. Um, and then experiencing, you know, crises, whether that mean, whether that's because of, uh, you know, an overkill the season before, which then has repercussions and there's, you know, a food scarcity, which is putting major pressure um, on a population, or um, if we can sort of look at what that means for us today with um, a civilization that seems um, to be accelerating towards, uh, collapse by a lot of measures. So how is it that we can use our observations um, and use the epistemologies um, to reconsider and um, remake our myths so that, uh, to, use a, to use a phrase um, I like, create a functional cosmology that um, provides a, a new way of essentially, you know, remaking our home to, for all practical purposes. Um, and I think, I think that, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure. I think that's, a long process. It's certainly been a process for me. I think that, um, like you said, sort of finding those ritual practices and starting there, and I think deepening, you know, because it's that liminal world, as you mentioned, uh, where where ritual um, is that um, really unites the here and now with that world beyond. Um, so. I'm, I like the term you used, like functional cosmology. Yeah, that was Devin uh, working with the Journey of the okay. Universe project. I got to <laughs> hand that to him. Um, but, but I mean, that's it, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it is. I mean, because it it seems like we are in um, a dysfunctional state that we are so habituated to, and we really look at the economic. I mean, you have this phenomenon of, of free market fundamentalism, where if you challenge certain, what we consider economic freedoms uh, in certain ways and sort of suggest that certain behaviors be limited, you know, that, that, is, that is an affront, that's the sacred cow that uh, people will sort of go to uh, their graves for. And it's, it's understandable on one level because uh, that is the source of their wealth and has been for so long. So of course they're gonna defend that um, to the death. 
um, and yet defending that to the death is going to mean an earlier death. And so the question is, uh, to me at least, how how do we shift those those values um, and sort of create new metaphors around which new paradigms can be shaped, new cosmologies, new epistemologies, um, and new ontologies uh, ultimately, so that you know we're living in a in another world uh, in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, you know, I'm doing that uh, in a different field. Um, you know, I'm interested in, in criminology and how uh, state state can you know state power constructs these ideas of what's valuable, what's good, what's evil, um, but but sort of challenging a lot of um, those those ethical bases because they're rooted in um, certain relationships that uh, we have found are, are rooted in that colonial extractive um, settler paradigm that is responsible for a lot of, um, you know, institutionalizing violence that is needed, you know, to maintain that way of uh, expanding territory and claiming it and processing it into goods that uh, and commodities that can enrich uh, certain certain groups so you know it's still bubbling um, your what you're what you're working on is um, great because it's it, it focuses on this on this core aspect I think of um, of this moment where it's a it's human and non-human relationship at the core of um, the subsistence um, economy. So it's, it's fascinating to think of. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious about that movie that you uh, started off uh, talking about. You'll have to share some links uh, yeah. that we can, um, we can have a resource page under your video. Yeah, it's it's um it's it's one of those movies that's not sort of online at mm -hmm. all, um, but I do like have the DVD and I can get access to another one. I'm I'm going to be working with the filmmakers for my research, and I just um, I showed the the ten minutes of it for the last PCC forum, which mm -hmm. didn't record, as you know, I do. and I uh, and, <laughs> and everyone got really sort of engaged and emotional about that first 10 minutes and i was like well, yeah maybe we can find a way to screen it um <laughs> people want <laughs> definitely joan pia how uh same question to you i'm gonna ask that do you find uh how do you relate your work to um chantal's or does it come in or uh, mine's a little bit different because it's 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 not people it's the big cats in the world so it's although i need to i will need to i'm i'm working on it um it's it's a it's a it's a big project because it's the interface between people and the big cats or we can say because there's so much um so many animals going extinct at one time um, right now that it's 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 you know it's big cats for me but it's it's so many other animals but big cats are the ones that really need the bigger space uh, smaller animals have a, a better chance of survival but even the smaller animals they can uh, you know they're 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 threatened too because if you have a if you have a larger matrix, uh, that's areas that are uh, there are that animals can live in. But if you have a large one, you get a little small animal. They they're threatened when they try to go t very far, you know, because they need shelter. They need uh, plant material to hide in as they they go across the areas that are are dangerous for them. I, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a, a problem. I mean, when you think of 600 lions left in the world, 4,000 cheetahs, 3,000 tigers, it's a, 
it's, it's, so all this helps though, because, you know, I was just looking at this as like, you're talking about finding ritual practice practices and, uh, and if one finds, you know, starts doing ritual practices, this will allow people to become more reverent. And if people become more reverent, then, and you know, that's like indigenous people where they had reverence for the nature around them. But if we could, but this, if we could have more reverence, this would allow us to, to live with other animals and to accept them into our community. And it would, it, this whole, you know, I see your, your talk Chantel is actually helping animals too, because I mean, we have this irreverence for anything in our society right now, because it's a, it's the industrial consciousness that's happening. You know, it's, it's, which has no reverence for life. It doesn't have reverence for life. I mean, we, we, we're losing our values. Uh, society's losing their values. Uh, it's, it's, it's a crime that, that, that uh, and so many human beings are, are lost in, in, within our society. I mean, young people are, are, I don't think they have a ground. They, they have a ground like, you know, I did when I was growing up or Chantel, when you were telling me that you grew up in, you know, in, 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 in the, uh, in South Africa and where it was quiet, where your, your family had a ranch or some sort of place where there were, there were animals. I mean, it's, I mean, that's such a huge difference in what happens with so many people. I mean, it, you know, this ritual though, I think would bring people back to, to their connection with nature. You know, I mean, I think this, this, this finding ritual practices because it, 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 it makes us be able to recognize, you know, something important and special in our lives. If you have a little ritual practice to be a, start to think about little things in life or whatever, whatever you come up against every day. I think we, we so many people are disconnected from, from who they are and how they feel and, um, yeah, because of our society and our, our industrial consciousness. John, I mean, that's such a great, I mean, I think the reverence part is so interesting. Um, and I'd be curious if you've, if you've focused in on this uh, at all and sort of that idea, that question of what causes refer reverence, because it seemed like, you know, and I keep coming back to that point well, that you made, that you made Chantal, um, of, of having more reverence for the um, traditional way of life uh, and the and the chase hunt um, than having than a reverence for for new technology and, and convenience uh, if it if it would destroy that uh, thing that that had more value so um, so Joan I was I was curious if if you had worked on that question of what catalyzes reverence. Wow. Um, it's really interesting because this last course I took, uh, Jake's course, Jake, Jacob Sherman's course, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the book of nature. And I ran into a, a mystic named Hugh of St. Victor, who is this, um, he was born in the 1100s and lived into the, the 1200s, the 13th century, you know, from the 11th century to the 12th century. And, and, um, uh, he he was uh, head of a of a monastery, and the people in the monastery were, you know, things were blowing up in Europe. You know, after the Crusades, there was all this this trade, and and so things were really changing. And and his monks weren't paying attention to their religious, you know, uh, practices. So he was saying Victor started this amazing thing about having reverent, doing this uh, m m uh, uh, mystic practice of, 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 uh, of uh, what, what would you call it? Um, contemplation. And the con the, this, this practice ended up by them contemplating on an animal and thinking of just how, you know, and then, you know, in, in, uh, 
in Hugh of saying Victor's book, um, he had he led people through this little meditation about, oh my God, what did it take for God to make an animal? I, what would it take for man to do anything? I mean, to make an animal, even the smallest animal, it would take an incredible amount of creation, you know? And so people were thinking about this and as they were thinking all these things about the beauty of the animal and how much it would take to make an animal, these people would be changed into a state of reverence. They would just fall into it. I mean, Joan, that's what's really interesting about that is it's like, I know that that's a huge part of some of the cosmological stories of ontological flux with animals, with the Bushmen. It's like, they're actually, they talk a lot about like, um, and they are sort of main figure of God. Um, they're not very, you know, pantheistic. They're actually very, in some ways you could say they're kind of monotheistic, but, but the names change. And they're often describing how things were made and they're often describing how animals came into being. And it's part of this process of reverence because it's this like awe of, and then this comes together to create that and what a miracle that that created this fourth thing and that fifth thing. And, and so, um, and so it's really interesting that you bring that story up because I think it's, it's highly related and it comes back to Max, Matt's question about cosmology and it's like, we are designed to do this. We are designed to create these stories because that is maybe how we, how we gain the reverence, how we, um, that's our way of finding a way to maintain reverence. Yeah, when, and it's something like when you get in deep contemplation, and you go to that place, there's, there's a, um, uh, it's, it's a, ends up being a mythological experience. And a mythological experience is when you actually, by, by concentration, you end up uniting with God. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a connection. And in that connection, that's where you get the, it, it's not even, it's, it's just like all of a sudden it happens. It's not even that there's any step. It's, it's, it's interesting. And then, of course, when I say get to God, I mean, we, you define it the way you want, you know? I mean, just like the Bushmen do. I mean, it's their, it's their connection or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just, <laughs> it just is. It happens. <laughs> but anyhow. Well, thank you, Matt and Aya, for holding this space this evening. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I appreciated meeting some of the other PCC students. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. PCC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Uh, well, thank you once more, Chantal. Um, I think we're going to see you uh, at the Deep Water Initiative on uh, March uh, 19th, I believe. Uh, and then the uh, fifth annual Religion and Ecology Summit um, as well. Uh, Aya, Aya also says, uh, thank you, Chantal. Um, thank you, Chantal. I've got a, I've got a scoot, but lovely. Um, thanks, Pierre. Really great to meet you, and it was fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, look forward to meeting you in the future in person. Yes, me too. Okay. <laughs> and thank you, Joan. Great yes. to see you. And yeah, yes. Matt, thanks again for all your efforts. No problem. Cool. Uh, and thank you for all joining the uh, first PCC forum of uh, spring 2020. I think next week, uh, February 6th, we're going to have Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Salah. Um, he's going to be talking about the uh, Arab awakening lessons learned from the 2011 nonviolent Egyptian revolution. So right. we will see you there. We will put this uh, video up shortly. And um, thank you all. And uh, Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.